Sheikh Faisal, thank you for, uh, I mean, Brother Faisal Kuti, thank you for uh, uh, bearing with us. And now we will be um, moving on to, um, inshallah, 25 minutes with uh, Brother Faisal Kuti. And before that, I would like to just give an intro. I'm sure everyone is a familiar of our dear brother. I know that I myself do follow him on Facebook and on um, LinkedIn. So, uh, mashallah, um, you know, he's a really important figure for us Muslims in Canada. Um, you know what, in fact, I want to actually start with just with the accolade as well that mashallah for the past 12 consecutive years, uh, Brother Faisal Kuti has been included in the Muslim 500, uh, which is the world's most influential Muslims published by the Royal Islamic Strategic Studies Center, uh, and center headquartered in Amman, Jordan. Um, in 2015 and in 2018, he was nominated by the Canadian Lawyer Magazine as a change maker. So Brother Faisal Kuti is a lawyer, law professor, writer, public speaker. He has taught at Barry University, um, the, the Duane O. Andreas School of Law in Orlando. The, well, I always get this one, uh, this one, uh, the Valparaiso University School of Law. I always have a tongue twister, even when I'm reading your uh, LinkedIn name, when I read that, I can never do it. Um, School of Law in Indiana and the Osgood Hall Law School of York University in Toronto. He founded a law firm more than 20 years ago, and after going through various name changes, the practice is now known as Guti and Associates with offices in Toronto, London, Ontario, and Lahore, Pakistan. Fantastic to see, uh, see hear that. Um, uh, Brother Faisal holds a JD from the University of Ottawa and an LLM from Osgood Hall Law School. While in law school, he served terms as the articles editor, editor and book reviews editor of the Ottawa Law Review. Mashallah, Brother Faisal, it regularly appears uh, in the Toronto Star, Al Jazeera, Middle East Eye, and many other publications. Um, he is a regular commentator on anti-terrorist law, national security, Islamic law, constitutional law, and the list goes on. Um, and he has publications are uh, non-academic publications and media around the world, including the New York Times, CBC News, Globe and Mail, Indian Express, Arab News. Uh, and to be honest, I could go on and on, mashallah, he's really, really accomplished. The last item I want to point out is that um, he was also um, the co-founder and serves as general counsel for the Canadian Muslim Civil Liberties Association. So he co-founded and served as a vice chair and legal counsel to the Canadian chapter of Council on American Islamic Relations, so CARE Canada, which has now been renamed to the um, to NCCM, which is the National Council of Canadian Muslims. So Alhamdulillah, our brother has been involved from the forefront for the Muslim community um, from you know from the onset, and also he has also served as Islamic Law and Culture Consultant for the famous show The Little Mosque on Prairie, an award-winning internationally acclaimed sitcom on the on CBC. So without further ado, I will ask Brother um, Fessel to, you know, just open it up. Please, uh, you know, speak about, um, it's open to you. And also please just give us more detail about your, your practice and all that. But also, I just had a couple questions that I wanted to give in the onset, and then I want to just open it up to you. Um, I just had two questions as well, and you can answer them later on, is that I just want to know your take on how to increase the presence of Islamic finance in Canada or in North America in general, and supporting of community initiatives that are helping to facilitate Islamic finance, like for Zero and other organizations that are helping um, across Canada. Um, and also in your experience, um, the similarities or differences of, of the regulations which are present in the US from your experience there to Canada, and you know how, um, you know, what are the strengths and weaknesses of both systems um, to help, you know, gain traction for Islamic finance in Canada? I know that's a large question, uh, but in any case, uh, with that, those are a couple items that came to mind, and I will now pass it on to our dear brother, Faisal Kuti. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khairan for that very generous uh, introduction. Um, if I can uh, at least influence my wife, then I think I would have achieved uh, wonders rather than being on that list, but uh, thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, first, I just want to, um, say thank you for organizing this and inviting me. Uh, as a lawyer, I'm going to have put forward two caveats uh, before I say anything. One is, uh, I am not an investor, I'm not an administrator, I'm not a board member, and I'm not the specific legal counsel 
for zero mortgage. So uh, I'm a completely independent lawyer. I don't have an uh, interest in this for, for people who are inquiring, why am I doing this? I'm doing this as an educational initiative uh, as I do for many different organizations. I've done these for banks. I do this for other um, alternative finance, Islamic finance organizations. So that's, uh, that's my involvement here. Secondly, I'm not endorsing or representing that any institution, zero or whatever institution is Sharia compliant or not. That's not for me to do. That's for you uh, to you know, speak to your own uh, religious scholars and uh, Zero Mortgage has consulted their own scholars. Uh, so that's something for you to do, um, you know, to determine whether or not this fits within your religious understanding. So I'm not here to comment on that. Uh, you know, you can verify for yourself and, 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 and do that, okay? Uh, I am here because I think it's a good, it's a project with a good intention. Because the intention here is to offer alternatives to Muslims. Many Muslims are out there uh, who don't want to go to the conventional route. Many Muslims go to conventional routes, and, and that's fine. If they, that's within their understanding, they want to do that. Everybody's answerable to Allah SWT on the Day of Judgment. I'm not going to sit and judge people, but there are many people who I know from my practice, they don't want to do that. They want to look for alternatives. Islamic finance, what they think Sharia compliant. So uh, I'm here because this is, a, this is a project with that intention in mind. They want to make something available. Uh, and so I do endorse attempts to introduce alternative finance and to develop that area. Because that area, unfortunately, is not very developed uh, in, in Canada. Uh, in the UK, they've gone a little further. Uh, in the US, they had some successes in, in, in some areas to push the boundaries. And again, uh, so in the Canadian context, this initiative, along with all these other Islamic finance initiatives out there, I'm hoping that they will contribute to push the regulations to, to improve things so that we can actually offer perfectly, uh, you know, uh, you know, perfect systems that are in line with both Canadian law and uh, Islamic law. Because the problem is to do that right now, because there's different rules and regulations that you have to, you're trying to sometimes fit a square peg into a, a hole. Okay. So it's very difficult. And people who are trying to do that, I can only encourage you to do that. Uh, history of Islamic finance. We have, we have a long history of Islamic finance attempts in Canada. Uh, I've written in this area. I've criticized many of the things that are done in the name of Islamic finance. I'm not here to hash that out right now, but you can, you can check those out. But I am here, I, I know there's a history of this and there's many institutions doing that. And uh, I think it's, 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 it's important that we, we try to push this. And the areas we need to push it on are in the Islamic finance area, which hopefully the Islamic finance scholars and the finance scholars will work out. Uh, there's also legal and consumer protection issues. Okay, so, and uh, Sheikh Nabil addressed two of these things uh, from the consumer agency and the legal agency. One was, you know, the cost. When things were sold as Islamic finance, it was usually more tougher to get these things. Yeah, it's much more expensive, uh, more costs involved. And then also security. People were afraid. What happens? Am I secure when I deal with these Islamic finance companies? So I'll talk about some of these things. Now, uh, I believe there's, there's a, a, a need for Islamic finance options to be available. As I said, because many clients come to me, they will not go. And what I find in the community is many people are not buying homes, okay? So as a Muslim activist, somebody who's been involved in the community, if we can make options available that are consistent with a person's religious understanding, okay? I'm here to endorse that idea because I believe we're at a critical juncture in our community where many of our people are renting, okay? So much of our community money is going towards renting. I have people who come to my office, they were you know, simple income earners, but they invested in real estate. And when they're retiring or when they're passing on, they're leaving estates worth millions of dollars in many cases. And these were just average people. But after 30 years, they've accumulated assets. Who benefits from that? their children, of course, but also the community that they're part of. Because economic empowerment, we can talk all we want about getting politically powerful in Canada. We can talk all we want about uh, getting economic base in Canada, but that's not gonna happen for Muslims. And I think there are studies uh, that actually show that our home ownership rate is among the lowest. Why? Because people are afraid to deal with the, with the, and for me, as a lawyer who's been practicing for 24 years, I, I deal with 
Muslim community, but also non-Muslim community. Non-Muslim community, many people who pass away, they leave large estates and they donate large amounts of money to churches, to synagogues, temples, whatever it is, okay? Uh, their institutions. In our case, it's a much smaller proportion. The people only leaving assets are usually professionals and business people. But the average Mo Muslim, uh, you know, is leaving very little because why? They have not purchased a home because it was religiously not permissible for them to do so in their mind. So if we can offer alternatives and do it in such a way that as uh, Sheikh Nabil said, costs are at the same level and the security from a legal perspective, if somebody came to me and said, hey, what do you think about zero mortgage? Am I safe to, uh, to buy a home through them? Well, if I look at the paperwork and the structuring of it, okay, what I see as a lawyer is a loan being advanced, however you structure it, that's your business. You, you know, just, just like a bank, somebody comes to buy something through a bank to me, I will say, you know what, you've arranged with this financial institutions to advance money. My job is to search the title and have this money advanced towards the purchase of your home, secure the financial institution and secure you, okay? The same thing is happening in zero mortgage. Uh, money is advanced. The zero mortgage, uh, you know, there's a lien registered against the property, but the ownership is in your hand. So I, so you're secure from that perspective, right? So from my, from my legal perspective, and I'm going to wear my hat as a community, somebody who's trying to empower the community. Uh, I think this is critical. We need uh, it, it's a, it's a critical point for us. And I, I know I know I'm, I'm repeating this over and over, but I think it is because nothing can happen in the political realm. Nothing can happen in terms of developing our institutions. If we are still relying on a very small amount, number of people who are professionals and who are business people who have that kind of money, that's a very small number. The vast majority of Muslims, if we don't allow them to own a house self, for their own selfish reason, which is they can't afford shelter, okay? The cost of sheltering has gone up. And we need, there's a basic need as the Sheikh said, so we need to facilitate ways to do that. And I think that's something that, you know, zero mortgage and all the other Islamic alternatives or alternative finance you have out there are encouraging. So what I hope that we get out of this is increased home ownership. But also what I hope that we get out of this is the pushing regulators, okay? You, you consumers, the people listening here, the 128 participants or however many participants are here uh, listening here need to push zero mortgage and all of the other alternative finance institutions to also from my perspective, to come together to make sure we start regulating this, okay? From an Islamic perspective as well. There's going to be diversity of opinion. I, I'm, I'm just like in every area of Islam, uh, I don't think you can, we're going to get uni, unanimous agreement on anything. In, in fact, the beauty of Islam is we have a diversity of opinion, right? So if you have these organizations, and I'm speaking to you now, the consumers of these goods, is of these services, is basically encourage and push the organizations here to come together to have some kind of a regulation from an Islamic perspective, and then also. From a government perspective, we want to push the regulators to make it more likely or, or easier for us to structure things from this alternative perspective. Okay, uh, because there is a demand. There, I mean, surveys have been done, and I'm sure you guys can address this. That there is a demand. If 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 a viable alternative was made available, would people take advantage? Yes. So the issue is, are there viable alternatives out there? So if you're working towards that. I think it's an important need to push. And I'll, just last week, actually, a, an individual came to me, uh, Amas came to me and said, look, we have somebody who wants to, uh, you know, they have no children and they're passing, they're gonna pass away, like everybody's gonna pass away, everybody tastes death. So this individual is, you know, close to the end and they have, alhamdulillah, they have some real estate accumulated, okay? Now that's being left to this masjid, probably, Six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so to me, this is a critical thing that we need to be encouraging. Not that I want you guys, all homeowners, to pass away and leave the stuff to the masjid. <laughs> you want to leave it for your children, who will then it, it's keeping it in the community, right? And I think for that, I think the intentions of these organizations, I think is good. I have criticisms of 
many of these things, but as a lawyer, as a critic, I'm, you know, I, that's what I do. I, I, I look for things to improve. And, and the reason I'm criticizing things is not just for the sake of criticizing it, at least that's what I hope I've been doing for 20 years, is to make, by, by offering criticism and by, uh, you know, suggesting improvements, the idea is to make something better. If we just accept everything as is and we're happy, you know, we don't grow. Growth comes from being challenged, okay? Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to look at all these Islamic institutions out there and say, hey, these are things you can improve. These are things you need to be better on, you know? And, and, and hopefully people like myself and other people who are doing this, uh, the, our purpose is not to just, as I said, criticize, is to improve these things. So um, from, a, from a legal perspective, okay, buying a home through uh, zero mortgage from the legal eye, there's not much difference. Okay, so I'm here to say that to people who are considering this, it's an option. Am I telling you to go through zero mortgage? No, I'm not. I'm not telling you to go through any alternative or conventional. That's your decision. You have to satisfy yourself as to what you think works for you. Okay, but I know one thing, the way the intention of this project, okay, from what I've gathered from speaking to the individuals and looking at the materials is to push it and make available options to people, more options. And the more options we have available, the better. Will, do these things need improvement? Yes, they do. Will they? I think they will. The more people uh, you know, participate, the, the, you, we expand the resource base, the demand for these things, uh, things can improve. Okay. So um, uh, you know, that's all I wanted to kind of uh, input here. Uh, and then I can answer any questions.